It's 1980. If you were to release a comic featuring your two biggest stars, who would they be? No, it's 1980. He wasn't that popular yet. That's right. Spider-Man and that guy off the TV, The Incredible Hulk. Now, if you could send them to any event in the world in 1980, which would it be? That's right. It's the Winter Olympics. And what else would you do to make the event extra special? That's right, you'd release it in a treasury edition. You, my friend, have made all the right decisions. Now, what is that phrase? Something about the whole is not equal to the sum of the parts? In 1974, Marvel began releasing a series of oversized treasury edition comic books. The material in these were largely reprints from titles such as The Fantastic Four, Conan the Barbarian, The Avengers and many more. It had a very odd and irregular publishing schedule. Their very first edition, which was The Spectacular Spider-Man, was released in January of 1974. But number two, which featured The Fantastic Four, wasn't released until December of the same year. But then in January 1975, no less than four were released. Occasionally, they would feature original work. One such example was issue 25, Spider-Man vs the Hulk at the Winter Olympics. Why the Winter Olympics, I hear you ask? Well, in 1980, the 13th Winter Olympics were held in Lake Placid, New York. So it seemed appropriate that Marvel would celebrate and commemorate the occasion by releasing an extra special comic. This comic would feature their two biggest stars at the time. Spider-Man's popularity had never waned since he burst on the scene back in 1962, and the Incredible Hulk was in the middle of his immensely popular TV run. The comic itself is largely forgotten these days, but it laid the foundations for every Marvel event that followed right up to the present day. You don't believe me? Stay tuned. We're all familiar with the two protagonists of this comic, but what about the antagonists? First of all, we have the Mole Man, now, the Mole Man is one of the oldest villains in the Marvel Universe, appearing in issue one of the Fantastic Four back in 1961. The other villain is Kala. Although she is nowhere near as well known as the Mole Man, she is almost as old. She first appeared facing off against Iron Man in issue 43 of Tales of Suspense in 1963. We actually need a bit more uh, background and a bit more context for these two villains. So, this is where it will start. Fantastic Four, issue 127 from 1972. The creative team on this one were both legends in their own fields. The writer was Roy Thomas, who although he did some work for DC, most of his work was for Marvel, including a significant run on the Avengers. The artist was big John Buscema. He worked on pretty much every character that Marvel had, uh, but he also had a significant run on the Avengers, and both of them famously came together and had legendary stints on Conan the Barbarian and the Savage Sword of Conan. It's a good cover with the strong colours that were prevalent during the 1970s and it's got word balloons. I don't think any cover is complete without word balloons. But there's a bit of an oddity on it because up here you see the strange spelling of the word comics with an X at the end. I don't know why they started doing this but it didn't last long. By issue 134 they'd reverted to the traditional spelling with a C at the end. Not even a CS. How weird is that? Anyway, enough of that. Let's have a look and see what's inside. Okay, so we start off right out the traps with a great opening line. A leviathan is a stir. Fantastic, isn't it? A leviathan is a stir. Slight downside to that is that the leviathan in question is the thing. Okay, okay, I know what you're, I know what you're thinking. I, I'll level with you. I've never been a fan of old school thing. Apparently he's adorable, people love him, all that kind of thing. I just think he's miserable and all he ever does is moan. I don't understand the attraction. He's got some odd obsession with Yancey Street. Uh, yeah, sure, Galactus is tough, but if he came to Yancey Street, he wouldn't last a day. Uh, the Silver Surfer, if he came down Yancey Street, they'd melt him down and make jewelry for old Ma Grimm. Whatever. Anyway, it's the thing we're dealing with. Um, he is making his way to what was going to be a new um, base of operations for the Fantastic Four, but it was destroyed by the Mole Man. And we have a little flashback uh, showing the Mole Man escaping from that particular episode where he escapes down, uh, down a portal to Subterranea. And the whole team's there 
Mr. Fantastic saying, couldn't stretch for him in time. Seriously, the only time your stretching ability would have actually come in use other than pulling a lever on the other side of the lab. Do me a favor. Anyway, they couldn't catch him. He did escape. Now the thing is on his own and he's gonna to try to get to Subterranea to speak to the Mole Man and maybe force him, if need be, to help Alicia. Maybe he can help her develop her own radar sense, which the Mole Man has, or maybe he could even cure her blindness. Wouldn't that be amazing? But that's why he's going there anyway. And he's had a little chat about it on his way. Meanwhile, we head over to Central Park where we find the Human Torch. And he's a bit glum. He's pining for Crystal, who is his current love interest. And then he flies around beating himself up, saying about uh, Reed's a man who'd lay his life down for Sue uh, or little Franklin. And Ben's a man underneath that craggy hide. Maybe the best man you'll ever meet. Yeah, well, that's a matter of opinion. Anyway, he lands uh, at the Baxter building where he comes across Mr. Collins. And Mr. Collins is their landlord. Uh, and at the moment, he's trying to get the whole team evicted because of the problems they're causing for the other residents. And during their little tete-a-tete, -tete, uh, Mr. Collins mentions the fact that the Fantastic Four are terrorizing all the respectable citizens of the building. Um, he also mentions the fact that the thing is off uh, to an appointment at the center of the earth. Human Torch plays it quite cool. I say he plays it quite cool. He actually burns the court order that Mr. Collins has and uh, burns a hole in the wall and flies up the lift shaft. Relatively cool, I suppose. But what he was playing it cool about was that mention of the journey to the center of the earth. And as he flies away from Mr. Collins up to the FF's lab, he's thinking, what on earth is the thing doing going uh, to Subterranea? Reed and Sue aren't there. They're often a little family jaunt. But Johnny Storm calls them up on the old comlink. And of course, they all agree that they need to go and find out what's going on with the thing and essentially to save him. Meanwhile, the thing has found his way to Subterranea and he's found some trouble as well, which is no bad thing for us, obviously. The trouble has taken the form of a giant mole, maggot, monster type thing. And there is a damsel in distress that this monster is terrorizing. Or so the thing believes. The damsel turns out to be Kala. But nonetheless, the thing uh, leaps in, fists flying, and defeats the mole maggot monster type thing. And Kala expresses her gratitude. And she approaches him and says, you interest me, grotesque one. A simple thank you would have done. Nonetheless, she thinks this is a decent chap. I didn't need saving, but he, he thought he was saving me. So he seems, seems a decent chap. And as soon as she mentions the fact that she is there to see her betrothed, who is actually the malignant mole man, the thing thinks, this is handy. I could have a way in here. So they strike up a kind of a friendship. She explains that she's from Atlantis. Now this is weird, because she's from Atlantis. And the thing says, oh right, yeah, where Submariner comes from. And she's like, never heard of him. So she's not from that Atlantis. Which actually means at this point in the history of Marvel, there were three Atlantises. Her Atlantis, which editor Roy Thomas actually states is not the same as uh, Prince Namor's Atlantis. And there's also Atlantis that Cull the Conqueror is king of. Now I suppose you could argue that maybe this Atlantis that Kala is from is that Atlantis, because of course Cull was in the past and it sank, but it does seem a bit odd. We've got three Atlantises, apparently no connection, all in the Marvel Universe, and they all have either sunk beneath the waves or are destined to sink beneath the waves. Anyway, what can you do? It's a common name. It's like Springfield, isn't it? It's a common name. Springfield, Atlantis, yeah, whatever. Meanwhile, the rest of the Fantastic Four team have arrived topside. And as they do, Reed and Sue are having a little discussion, a little marital tiff, basically about the role that she plays or should be playing within the team. It's a bit of an old fashioned view from Reed, especially when your wife can actually turn invisible. But nonetheless, he is a bit old fashioned, isn't he? We all know that. He's kind of more in love with his science experiments than his wife. That's the 
um, accusation commonly leveled at him. And I've got to say at this point that the Fantastic Four as individuals, they aren't easy to like. You've got Reed Richards, who is often portrayed as an emotional vacuum um, that cares more about science than, than people. You've got the Human Torch, who is often cocky or arrogant. And then you've got the Thing. If it wasn't for Susan Storm, you wouldn't want to be friends with any of them, would you, really? Anyway, they get over their tiff. They find the entrance to Subterranea that the Thing uncovered earlier in the issue, and they descend in it in their fantastic car uh, themselves. Little do they know that the Thing's fortunes have taken a turn for the worse, because he's trapped on some kind of giant metal web type thing because Kala knew all along that he was the thing. She's evil, you see, that's what they do. They're very dishonest people, evil people. So he's trapped on the web. Whilst he's trapped on the web, her betrothed makes his appearance. That's the malicious mole man, of course. And along with him, uh, we have his servant, his current servant anyway, who's brainwashed. His name is Tyrannus. Now he was traditionally a rival of the Mole Man's for dominion over Subterranea, but as I say, he's been brainwashed, so he's now his servant. And he was often, certainly in the old days, he was a traditional enemy of the Incredible Hulk. The Mole Man, as all the best villains do, explains his nefarious plan to the Thing, which is basically, he's got this giant machine and he's gonna drill into the core of the planet and drill up through the crust of the planet and lava will spout everywhere and the whole surface of the earth will be covered in lava. I'm not sure if to, in terms of geophysics if that's how it would work, but that's his plan. And I'm not really sure why he's doing it other than just because he's not very nice. The realization that three billion lives, uh, that's the population of the earth back in 1972, uh, that three billion lives depend on him inspires the thing and he fights and he breaks free of the large metal net and he fights all the subterraneans. Overwhelming numbers, but it's the thing. So he overcomes those odds. And then as he staggers away from the battle, his appearance changes to that of a terrifying monster. And this is a side effect of where he was on the metal net earlier. There is a little bit more of an explanation to it than that in the comic, but you know what? It doesn't make any more sense. At that point, the rest of the team arrive, just in time to see this terrifying monster. So the human torch says, stand back guys, I'll deal with this monster. And he flies in and attacks, unknowingly, the thing. And that's where that issue ends. As you would imagine, the story continues in issue 128. Now we are promised something a little bit extra with this issue, because down here in the corner of the front cover, you see it promises free bonus, four big extra pages of full color pinups. Well, that sounds very generous, but experience has taught us that what it really means is that the story won't fill the whole comic, so they've packed out the last few pages with some pinups. Anyway, let's have a look at it. We pick up in this issue where we left off in the last, which is with the human torch attacking the thing. Of course, he doesn't realize it's the thing, but Reed Richards does because he's clever. And he does explain later on in the issue how he knew, but there's some massive long convoluted conversation between him and Sue as to why he's saying, no, we've got to stop Human Torch attacking that monster. She's saying, why? There's no time to explain. Just say, it's the thing. I know it's the thing, but he doesn't. But there you go. Of course, the confusion does all get sorted out in the end and the torch doesn't kill the thing which may be a good thing, maybe not. But in doing so, through various contrivances, the whole team are left seemingly unconscious. Watching all this unfold on a screen from the safety of his hideaway is of course the maladjusted Mole Man and his bride-to-be, Kala. They enjoy gloating, as you'd expect. Baddies like gloating, don't they? And she's like, yeah, this is wicked. Um, I tell you what, while you're busy gloating over that, why don't I take Tyrannus and go and uh, start sorting out the food for our wedding? He's like, yeah, sure, N knock yourself out. Speaking of knock yourself out, as they go to leave, he trips up Tyrannus just to make him look a fool, uh, and him and Kala have a good old laugh about that. Anyway, off they go to deal with the, um, the, the wedding feast. 
Meanwhile, the Mole Man returns his attention to the screens to see what he hopes to be the rotting corpses of the Fantastic Four, only to discover, you've guessed it already, haven't you? They've gone. Mole Man isn't very impressed with this turn of events, as you can imagine. So he and his subterraneans and a humanoid hidden in the shadows that he refers to only as a very special surprise set off to investigate to find out where they've gone. We then discover that they were there all along but they were made invisible by Sue Storm who at this point is the invisible girl rather than the invisible woman. That's a few years off yet. Despite the fact that they are still there and they're all still alive they're all a bit beaten and a bit battered, a bit worse for wear. They decide to split up to go and search for the Mole Man to track him down with Sue and the Thing going in one direction and Reed and the Human Torch going in the other. And it's not long before those two stumble across a whole horde of subterraneans and of course have a fight, which is great, that's what we want. Next thing, we... who would have thought it? Now you remember the big four uh, extra pages of full colour pinups and the fact that that was going to be just a filler and a bit of a rip off. I was totally wrong. Here they are. We do have four pages of glossy pinups and they are extra as well. The art of course is by Big John Bushima. We have the villains, Doctor Doom and our current uh, villain, the Mole Man. We've got some characters that, have, are they friends, are they foes? The Hulk, Submariner, oh, I'm never sure about the Submariner, I never liked him. I think it's his eyebrows. The Silver Surfer and Galactus. Uh, the Frightful Four, including the Sandman, wearing the costume that it seems he was contractually obliged to wear when he was in the Frightful Four. I always preferred him with his stripy jumper. And also we have the uncanny Inhumans, or as I like to think of them, the boring in humans. Sue and the Thing stumble across a kidnapped reverend, kidnapped by the Mole Man to preside over the nuptial festivities. The Mole Man may well be a mass murderer, but he insists on his wedding being above board. They break out the reverend, and then, not long after, they stumble across the Mole Man's throne room, and they're hiding in the shadows, kind of checking it out, seeing what's going on. Unfortunately, the Reverend manages to knock over what must be the only vase in the whole of Subterranea. And of course, the Mole Man overhears the sound of this smashing vase and sends his Subterraneans in to deal with the interlopers. And it all kicks off, basically. The Thing does the vast majority of the fighting, it has to be said, which is ironic because certainly for quite some time now, it has been recognised that uh, the Invisible Woman is the most powerful member of the Fantastic Four. Nonetheless, we're talking muscle here, and it's clobbering time, etc, etc. And he fights the majority of the Subterraneans, along with the very special guest that turns out just to be some big kind of android that doesn't last very long. The Thing is on the verge of total victory when the Mole Man takes him out of action using his staff. He does the same with the invisible girl as well. And then the human torch is carried in by a load of humanoids, although there's no sign of Reed Richards at this point. So the Mole Man is getting ready to gloat again because he's been victorious. And at that point, he's suddenly enwrapped by uh, rings of pure energy. And they have been fired by a gun in the hands of Tyrannus, who isn't hypnotized and is in fact in cahoots with Kala. And Kala has turned on the Mole Man it's terrible. You should never trust a baddie. No, seriously, you never should trust a baddie. Because then Tyrannus turns against Kala and wraps her in the energy rings. Kala admits that she never loved Mole Man. Uh, in fact, she thinks he's a grotesque parody of all that's beautiful. Fair enough. Uh, and all she ever wanted was control of his subterraneans. Because they're such a great army. The Mole Man now has the major hump. So he pushes a button on his belt which frees the three members of the Fantastic Four from the energy bubbles that they were held in. Not only that, but Reed Richards is actually there. 
and he disarms Tyrannus. Where was he? Well, he explains that he used his elastic body to mould his face so that it looked like a subterranean. And he also happened to bring along some skin dye so that he was the right colour as well. With that unlikely explanation out the way, Tyrannus makes it back to his feet and runs off to one of the Mole Men's rockets. And he flies off in the rocket, but the Mole Man's like, ha ha, don't you worry. And he reveals that actually he booby-trapped the rocket in case Kala tried to use it without his permission. And it blows up with Tyrannus on board. And the human torch is shocked by this. And he says, you mean you didn't even trust your own bride-to-be? Why, you crummy. Yeah, how can you not trust Kala? I mean, she's such a lovely, trustworthy... Oh, God, yeah. Anyway, the thing grabs a hold of Mole Man and says, you tell me how to cure blindness. And the Mole Man says, I can't cure blindness. If I could, I'd have done it to myself. And the thing's all like, oh yeah, didn't we really think of that? So that's the end of that. Meanwhile, Reed reprograms the tunneling lava squirty machine so that it self-destructs. The team jump into the fantastic car and manage to fly out of Subterranea just in time to avoid the explosion that ensues. The last thing we are left with is a view of the Mole Man on his throne, a tear running down his cheek as he realises he will always be alone. Loser! Okay, we still need a bit more background. And for that, we're gonna move on to the Fantastic Four Annual from 1978. This is written by Bill Mantlow, who has done a lot of work for Marvel over the years, but is probably best known for creating Cloak and Dagger and a four year run on Alpha Flight in the 1980s. God, I loved Alpha Flight in the 1980s. And the art is by Big, J oh no, sorry. It's actually by Sal Buscema, brother of Big John. Sal worked on various titles for Marvel and DC over the years, and is probably best known for his 100 issue run on the Spectacular Spider-Man. He has a certain distinctive style, certainly when it comes to facial expressions and some of his action sequences. I remember he was particularly a fan of the backhanded punch. Anyway, let's have a look at this. Okay, here we go. First things first, I love chapters. And here we have chapter one, Nightlife. And as you can see, the Human Torch is celebrating. And it's celebrating the fact that the Fantastic Four are a team once more. They split up briefly in issue 191. And for the next nine issues they continued, but they were having solo adventures. And then the team reunited just in time for the landmark 200th issue. And this was released shortly after them. So he's over the moon, uh, although he's irritating a few people, not least the fire department uh, with his flaming antics. But nonetheless, nothing can dampen his spirits because he's enjoying himself so much. He then goes to Alicia Masters' apartment where the rest of the team are as she unveils her latest statue. Amongst the other statues dotted around the apartment is one of the Mole Man which is a little bit unusual, really, isn't it? You think the Fantastic Four would question that? Her choice of subjects, one of their greatest foes? And we see the thing is reading a newspaper, well, he's reading the back page, but we see the front page, uh, and the headline saying, strange disappearances continue to plague NYC. They all decide to go out to Beerenberger to celebrate Alicia's latest triumph. But shortly after they leave, the thing that I, foolishly thought was a statue of the Mole Man because he was grey and in a frozen pose and standing in front of everybody, uh, comes to life. Turns out he wasn't a statue after all. He hops off of the pedestal and sneaks out of the apartment and he meets up with his subterraneans. I, I don't get it. I don't understand why he was kind of hiding like a statue in the apartment in the first place and then why as soon as the Fantastic Four left, he sneaks, he sneaks out. That is weird. But then I'm not an evil genius, so I probably wouldn't get it, would I? Uh, he leaves the apartment, meets up with his subterraneans, and then they embark on a series of kidnappings and uh, thefts. And the thefts are of statues, and the kidnappings are of blind people uh, and ugly people. Seriously, uh, they specifically kidnap ugly people. We see a two-panel cameo from Daredevil, with Matt Murdock putting on the mask and leaving his office via the window. 
and the subterraneans get there just a little bit too late so they can't kidnap him so one assumes they wanted to kidnap him because he was blind uh, rather than because he was ugly but I may be wrong we then move on to chapter two where we meet the most New York or should I say New York uh, newspaper sales boy imaginable and you can see the headline there uh, dozens vanish new wave of disappearances statues stolen throughout city police baffled police are always baffled aren't they in in comics and films they're always baffled there's no holding back they're not like quizzical they are baffled anyway we see how adorable the thing is um, as he embarks on a slanging match with this small child which is great he the thing that is um, gets miserable obviously is he ever not miserable uh, tears the suit he was wearing um, and he says uh, he gives the suit jacket away and says two of them could wear one of my jackets sheesh I bet you could make a bedspread out of my overcoats and Alicia uh, proving that she's not just literally blind um, but also metaphorically blind to his faults says that's because there's so much of you to love Benjamin At this point, we see that the Fantastic Four really are on their uppers. You remember that they recently split and then reformed, but as things stand in this uh, annual, they don't have access to the Baxter building and they're traveling around, as can be seen here, uh, by bus. Sue suggests maybe they should look into these disappearing statues and kidnappings, but Reed says, oh, it's, a, it's a matter for the police. And that's it, and that's that for now. Soon though, we see that the Mole Man uh, and he's uh, sorry the um, the misanthropic mole man and his subterraneans uh, break back actually I say it's the mole man uh, it could be anyone because up to this point he's been constantly shrouded in shadow I'm sure there were plenty of four foot high base and hair cutted um, squat people in New York City who wear green robes with a very high kind of whatever that thing is like behind his head um, it could be anyone, really, couldn't it? But whoever they are, with their group of people that look like subterraneans, but could equally be anybody, um, they break back into Alicia Masters' apartment whilst the Fantastic Four are out. Not for long, though, because the Fantastic Four soon return. Alicia hears something going on in the apartment, and so they burst in, uh, only to find that, shock of shocks, it's the Mole Man. And that's presented as though it's a shock as though the reveal is to us as the reader as well as the Fantastic Four. But like I said, I have no idea who else it could have been other than the Mole Man and his subterraneans. Speaking of the subterraneans, it's interesting to see uh, at the moment they, they don't have their eye covers. Uh, it's crazy. I, I guess it's because they're out at night, but um, they just look permanently startled. It's quite funny. Anyway, as you'd expect, it all kicks off. The Mole Man starts swinging his staff, um, Reed stretches as he does, uh, and the thing lays into the subterraneans. Johnny flames on, uh, and then the thing isn't only throwing out his fists and feet, but he's throwing out insults. And he says here, get off me, you walking needed erasers. You walking needed Erasers, like needed, like, like bread. Needed erasers. What the hell is needed eraser? Is that, I have no idea what a needed eraser is. Actually, don't worry, I'll Google it. And a needed eraser is um, an eraser that you can mold into shape and is used by people who are doing like technical drawings or illustration. So I'm guessing it's an in joke by the bullpen. But how many people would have been reading that and would have got the joke? Uh, unless everybody in 1978 had needed erasers. Maybe they were the thing, the in thing. Everyone had a needed eraser. Odd. I don't even know if the subterraneans know what they are. I can imagine them discussing it amongst themselves. Did he just insult us? Well, it sounded like he was trying to insult us. I'm not sure I feel insulted, though. I just feel confused. Incredibly, the needed erasers overpower the Fantastic Four. All but the Invisible Girl, that is and she follows them as they kidnap Alicia Masters. The rest of the team soon see a signal outside the window, which is the Fantastic Four uh, distress flare that's been sent up by Susan. 
And here we see, again, an illustration of the fact that they don't have their previous resources, as they have to get a cab. And we have this view of Mr. Fantastic and the Thing getting out of a cab so they can answer the flare. And here we see the Invisible Girl with her flare gun uh, and Reed Richards saying, it's a good thing I modified our flare guns to be carried inside our belts. Thanks for explaining. Anyway, shock of all shocks, the Thing gets into an argument with the cab driver. Uh, and towards the end of that, he ends up saying, you didn't grow up on Yancey Street, did you? He's obsessed. Anyway, turns out the cab driver did grow up on Yancey Street. Okay, fair enough. I'll give you that one. Then Reed and Sue uh, embark on an argument which could literally have been lifted from the last story we, story we read, practically word for word, where he wants her to stay behind and he's worried about her. And listen, Reed, uh, I, I'm not just your wife or mother, I'm also the invisible girl, all that kind of thing. They get over it, doesn't last very long. They descend into the subway and there they find the entrance to the mole man's lair. And on discovering his lair, they find this vast space full of all the stolen statues and the kidnapped blind people and ugly people. Where all these kidnapped people are concerned, none of them are tied up. They're all there just kind of mooching around. They seem okay with it. Alicia Masters is there uh, also. And again, we assume uh, not because she's ugly. And the thing shouts out, we're here to rescue you, baby. Uh, but she starts to try to explain something, saying, Ben, I don't think you understand. But she doesn't get the explanation out uh, because the thing is zapped by the murderous mole man's um, mole ray, or whatever, his gun anyway. He then tries to explain to them uh, these people haven't been kidnapped, they're my guests, and the statues were just borrowed. Which is a bit odd, because when you look back to like page 10 and 11, uh, we clearly see his guests being put into bags and dragged away. Strange way to invite guests to a function. Anyway, just like us, the thing ain't buying it. And you know what? We don't really care, because now we're moving on to chapter 5, which is called Battle. Bring it on! As it happens, the battle only lasts a page before all the kidnapped people turn on the Fantastic Four. It turns out they like being there. They like being in a world that accepts them for who they are, whether they be blind or ugly. This just makes the thing angry, and he genuinely uh, wants to start beating up the blind and ugly people. He's so lovable. But before things turn genuinely ugly, the Mole Man is able to blurt out an explanation, saying he wanted to give these people a world where visual appearances didn't matter. And actually a lot of them are happy to stay there, and they are happy to stay there. But Alicia Masters isn't one of them. She wants to leave along with the Fantastic Four, and she does so. But before she goes, she leaves the Mole Man a gift, which is a life-size statue of him. And he's thrilled with this, overjoyed. And we finish the whole story with a nice picture of the whole team, the Fantastic Four, and they've all got big cheesy smiles on their faces, except for the thing, of course. So there you go, Fantastic Four. Are we done now? Because this is supposed to be about Spider-Man and the Hulk. So please, no more Fantastic Four, ever. And now we move on to what you've all come here for. You can see it, can't you? Treasury editions were massive, significantly larger than standard comic book size. The format was pioneered by DC Comics in 1972 when they released Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. As I've already said, Marvel jumped on the bandwagon in 1974, starting off with the spectacular Spider-Man. A lot of people will tell you that the first time those two companies collaborated was on 1976's Superman vs. Spider-Man, but this is not true. 1975 was their first collaboration, when they both worked together on an adaptation of The Wizard of Oz. Then, in 1976, was the first time that characters from both companies crossed over, and that was the Superman vs. Spider-Man Treasury Edition. And here it is. The cover art for this one is by Al Milgram. He's an artist that I really enjoyed growing up. The interior art, though, is by Herb Trimp. Over the years, Herb Trimp worked on most of Marvel's characters, but he's most associated with The Incredible Hulk, being lead artist on that comic from 1968 until 1975 and that included Wolverine's first appearances 
in issues 180 and 181. The writing team on this one consisted of three writers. Bill Mantlow returns, he was the writer of the Fantastic Four annual, and he's joined on this one by Stephen Grant, not a particularly well-known writer, but his big claim to fame is that he wrote The Punisher's first limited series in 1986. Mark Grunewald is the third writer, and he's something of a legend in Marvel circles. He had an encyclopedic knowledge, which apparently was the inspiration for the Marvel Universe handbook. He also had a 10-year run writing Captain America, from 1985 to 1995, during which time he wrote every single issue except one. He also wrote what I consider to be the best title for Marvel's New Universe line, which was DP7. So that's the creative team. We know our heroes, and we also now know the backgrounds to our villains. We may as well have a look at it. So here we go, finally, the main event, no pun intended, Spider-Man versus the Hulk at the Winter Olympics. The size of this thing is amazing. We've got, look, that is a double page spread. You could wallpaper your house with it. Seriously, it's massive. And we're straight into the action as we see a group of shady figures apparently trying to kidnap Maria Karsov, an ice skater for the USSR and Spidey is swinging in to save the day. Now, I don't know if Maria Karsov was actually a real person. If she is, I'm afraid history has forgotten her because I've searched on the internet and there's no mention of her at all, apart from in this comic. Nonetheless, he swings in to save the day. And this is still the period, um, very old school, where baddies and even the good guys announce themselves in the third person. Like here, where one of them says, and for that, the power of landslide will be more than sufficient. And here, another one says, Not once the diamond-hard claws of Digger tear your perch out from beneath you. And there are two other members of the team as well. One of them is called Boulder, and one's called Water Witch, uh, to whom Spider-Man at one point says, A woman with the voice of a withered old crone. It's a bit rude, isn't it? Anyway, he fails in stopping them from getting to Maria Karsov. And just as one of them approaches her, I think it's Digger, judging by the side of, size of his hands, she whips his hood off and we see that he's hideously ugly underneath. Ugly? It couldn't be, could it? Anyway, uh, Spider-Man tries to break free uh, from his little prison that, that, that they put him in and again, save Maria, but he fails because just as he gets close to her, this big diamond thing appears, encases her and takes her underground. Now he tries to use his webbing to stick onto it and pull her free, but it doesn't stick and he fails. And now we learn that these people who are called the outsiders weren't trying to kidnap Maria Karsov at all. They were actually trying to protect her from another character that we haven't yet seen. And Spider-Man spoilt the whole thing by turning up and wading into them, assuming the worst. Now security turn up and the outsiders and Spider-Man all split the scene. He quickly changes his clothes because we soon see Peter Parker in the Olympic Village uh, with another reporter, and they're talking to Brad Rossi. Uh, Brad Rossi is an American Olympic skier, and he's explaining that Maria Karsov is the third Olympic athlete to be kidnapped, along with Claude Lebron, French bobsleigh, and Bobby Kyle, Canadian hockey champ. Now, I don't know if these people are real. I do doubt it, but I don't know for certain. I'm pretty sure Brad Rossi isn't, because we're told that he went to school with Peter Parker in Midtown High. And then the next page, oh my gosh, that is a double page spread. Now this is pure old school Hulk. He's kind of always angry. He's always wanting to smash puny humans, all that kind of thing. But don't get me wrong, it's great fun. What 10 year old boy wouldn't love the Hulk uh, in this era? Anyway, he's bouncing along the mountaintops when suddenly he's encased in one of those diamonds that we saw Maria Karsov be trapped in. And it's something to do with these people down below him, and they are lava men. So who's in charge of the lava men? I dare say we'll soon find out. This whole chapter really is just a fight between Hulk and the lava men, which is no bad thing. But at times it does get a bit farcical. For example, here we've got him driving off about half a dozen of them by throwing snow at them. And down here, another half a dozen of them go rolling off down the hill in a giant comedy snowball. I do think the writing for the Hulk must have been pretty tedious during this period because there really 
is so little variation in the kind of thing he says. Hulk will take lava men's weapon away from them, and Hulk will make sure lava men never use it to try to hurt Hulk again, and he's always talking about himself. The guy's obsessed. It's at the end of the chapter that he kind of puts a bit of distance between himself and the lava men. He runs into a cave, but then in that cave, a woman appears and she approaches him. And who is it? It's Kala. Then we move on to chapter three. What? It's them, they're back. It's the Fantastic Four. Of course, Ben Grimm is the only one not smiling. This is an interesting page actually with a few cameo appearances. For example, here we got, well, I'm guessing it's Doctor Strange. Could be Tony Stark, but I think Doctor Strange. This has got to be the X-Men. Surely Scott Summers, Jean Grey, Logan chomping on his cigar. And then down here in the corner, we've got two characters. One saying, isn't this something, Linda? And then one saying, it's wonderful, Herb. That's actually Herb Trimp and his wife. They are all there to witness the ski jump, and we will witness the ski jump. We see Brad Rossi jumping and flying through the air. We see him, after his jump, meeting up with Peter. Uh, hi Pete, hi Brad, because of course they're old school friends, and Brad's fiance is there. We see Brad's uh, rival take their jump and actually go into the lead. So Brad needs to take another jump. But this time, as he's sailing through the air, he gets encased in another one of those giant crystals. Now Peter, of course, knows what's going on here. So he hands the camera to the, his fellow reporter and says, if you want a picture, take it yourself. He should get sacked really, shouldn't he, for that attitude. But anyway, it's what he does all the time, isn't it? He's good at it. Uh, by the way, this isn't a Daily Bugle reporter, because at this point in his career, Peter was working for the Globe. Anyway, he runs off to try and save Brad Rossi, but gets there a bit too late. And as with Maria Karsov, we see him vanish beneath the snow. Peter changes into his Spider-Man outfit in time to bump into, quite literally, a Boulder from the Outcasts and Water Witch, who uses her power to explode a water tower, which engulfs Spider-Man and freezes instantly. It's that cold. He continues his fight with the Outcasts, but on this occasion he's bested by them and knocked unconscious. When he comes to, he discovers he's underground and the mastermind behind all this is revealed. Da, da, da. It's the murderous mole man. So what exactly is going on? Well, that group of people that were trying to protect the Olympic athletes and so far have failed at every attempt and that kidnapped Spider-Man, the outcasts, and we know at least one of them is ugly, don't we? Uh, they were actually members of the ugly people that were kidnapped by the Mole Man in the Fantastic Four annual. Now they still live with the Mole Man, they still work for him, and he is at war with Kala, because Kala wants the Fountain of Youth, which is in his territory. And as he says here, I will never grant Kala access to it, for she ridiculed me and spurned my offer of love. He also wants Spider-Man to fight for him, and to do this, he needs a bit of leverage, and he has created another massive machine. This time, it won't destroy the entire world. It seems quite modest, to be honest, by comparison. It will destroy the Olympic Village. Nonetheless, Spider-Man has his sense of responsibility, so he agrees he will then fight for the Mole Man. Speaking of fight, would you like to see some action? Here, we have another double page spread showing the two opposing forces in action. On one side, we have the Mole Man's forces, so the humanoids and the outcasts. And opposing them on the other side is Kala's Lava Men. Despite all the action, it's pretty much a stalemate. So one of the Lava Men runs back to Kala and tells her it's time to send forth her champions to tip the balance in their favour. So who will these champions be? Well, if you hadn't worked out by now, it's a fair bet to say that one of them is going to be the Hulk. We have got a nice single page a splash here. And it's a great page. Look at all these strong colours, uh, clean, bold lines. It's great, it really is. So the Hulk, at the moment, is drinking lots, he's eating lots, ignorant to the fact that Kala has actually filled all the food and drink with mind control drugs. Other than him, we've got the four Olympic champions. They are still trapped in their crystal prisons and they've been added to by Brad's fiance, who's just been wheeled in in her own crystal prison. 
she is zapped by Kala uh, with Kala's aging ray, which turns her into a very old woman. And now Kala says, if you don't uh, battle for me, then your fiance will never be young again. At this point, at the top of page 37, we can see that uh, Maria Karsov says, though you may have the power to translate our words to a common tongue that we may speak to each other, very good of you to explain. The next page, however, we see that the French competitor is actually speaking French. How does that work? I don't know. Shortly after that, though, we reach what has to be the low point of this comic. I mean, look at it. Each competitor now has an additional jetpack attached to their skis or their boots, or they can fire things at their ski poles or from their hockey stick. Uh, this, the hockey player is even super strong now for some reason that we don't really know. It's just painful. Regardless, they are her champions, four of them anyway. At that point, the Mole Man appears on the monitor screen and he suggests that they have a contest of champions whereby he and Kala both select a handful of champions each to batter out for supremacy of subterranea and access to the Fountain of Youth. She agrees because she's sick of the mindless slaughter of all the humanoids and lava men. But as soon as the monitor screen turns off, she unveils her fifth champion, which is the Incredible Hulk, dressed in gladiator gear. They really should make more of that. At that point, we return to the Olympic Village as someone shouts earthquake because the ground is rumbling and the murderous mole man's magnificent machinery lifts up the Olympic Village into the air. So they are now isolated. The mole man and Kala both appear in the Olympic Village and unveil their competitors. We see Kala's Olympians and the Hulk and the mole man is shocked by this and he says, I've known since the day you betrayed me to Tyrannus that you could not be trusted. Well done, Sherlock. Anyway, at that point, he unveils his new champion, which is Spider-Man. You know, it's only at this point that I realise how little Spider-Man has featured in this comic. Anyway, in the next panel, we see a bystander shout out, keep the television cameras rolling. We're about to witness the fight of the century. I think you'll find that's another treasury sized edition. Nonetheless, let's get the battle underway. And we come to our last double page spread. And there's lots of action here, lots of sports based action. Maria Karsov is skating on the ice whilst Water Witch tries to break it up around her feet. Boulder is trying to throw, well, boulders into the net of the ice hockey player. The net, by the way, is on fire for some reason. And Spider-Man faces off against the Hulk. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about what happens from this point because this is the grand finale and I'll let you discover that for yourselves if you get the chance. One thing I will point out is that something happens here that used to happen a lot in older Spider-Man comics, which is where he would make shapes with his webbing. On this occasion, what's he made? Got to be, hasn't it? Web skis. Excellent. Other than that, Kala is defeated, she turns old again, and the Mole Man tries to comfort her with these lovely words. Old you are, and ugly, but there are many such in my kingdom. And he offers her the chance to join him. What is more bizarre is she is actually comforted by those words, but she does walk off with him. The Olympic Village returns to its resting place back on Earth, and all the other protagonists and antagonists go their separate ways. And we finish off with a nice little moral delivered to us by Spidey. So what's the verdict? Well, it's old fashioned. It's old fashioned in its artwork and in the characterization, the dialogue and the motives of the characters in it. But old fashioned comics normally have one or two things going for them. They normally have a bit of charm and are rather fun to read. But this, for some reason that I can't put my finger on, doesn't have either of those things. If anything, to finish the whole comic is something of a drag. So why are we covering it? Well, you may remember at the beginning, I said it was an important comic for the future of Marvel events. And I believe that's true. In here, on the inside back cover, we have an advert, although some may consider it a threat. And the advert says, coming this summer, Marvel superheroes at the Summer Olympics. Guaranteed, guaranteed mind, 
to be the most awesome assemblage of heroes ever seen in one Titanic tale. Sadly, or perhaps happily, that event never happened. We never got to see the Marvel superheroes at the Summer Olympics. Instead, due to political reasons that I'll go into in another programme, that event became the Contest of Champions. The Contest of Champions was Marvel's first limited series and showed them what they could do with that format. Soon after that, we had Marvel Superheroes Secret Wars. And that was the inspiration for every other event since, right up to the present day. All because of this. You're not buying it? Okay. Well, let's put it this way. Marvel Superheroes Secret Wars was only made possible because of the dry run of the Contest of Champions. And the Contest of Champions was a direct descendant of this comic. Believe me now, 